everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you from the state capitol today where people from across Oklahoma are here talking about and celebrating OSU agriculture. We'll have more a little bit later in the show. But first, it is shaping up to be quite an active tick season in our state for both livestock and humans. Oklahoma livestock producers will have a challenging year this year with the extent of ticks that they're going to be dealing with. We already have cattle producers that have major uh, Gulf Coast tick problems, sometimes called ear ticks in, in cattle. And so when they have that, they're going to have to probably treat their, those animals. Uh, if they don't, they'll cause a condition called gotch ear. And ticks are a pasture problem, so it's not necessarily the extent of what you do on the animal, but it's essentially trying to figure out how bad your tick population is going to be for this year and seeing if you can rotate out of a problem pasture. In Oklahoma, we have two types of ticks, soft ticks and hard ticks, and the majority of ticks that we're going to see coming out from now until the end of the summer are hard ticks. Uh, those are going to include the Lone Star tick, the American dog tick, and the Gulf Coast tick that would be biting both livestock and humans. Our, our biggest concern would be both the Lone Star tick and the American dog tick because those two are involved in uh, tick-borne pathogens. Oklahoma is a hotbed for tick-borne diseases, but where we really have an advantage is we don't have hardly uh, any Lyme disease in Oklahoma because the tick that transmits that is the black-legged tick or more commonly called the deer tick and uh, it tends to feed on reptiles in, uh, in its immature stages uh, and, and in some cases as an adult they'll feed on reptiles. In contrast, up in the Northeast and Midwest, this same tick is around but feeding on mice. And mice are what we call reservoir for the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. So we don't have much Lyme disease in Oklahoma, but what we do have are what we call our spotted feeder, fever rickettsiosis, which includes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is a challenge because uh, especially on the eastern half of Oklahoma, you're gonna have high tick populations, high areas that can harbor a lot of tick populations in general, uh, and you've got a lot of human contact. The other challenge is uh, with the Lone Star Tick. The Lone Star Tick is the one with the white dot on its back. And it's, it's a very aggressive tick, so if you're walking down a trail, it is going to try to get on you uh, and, and to feed on you. Uh, they have uh, identified other pathogens within the Lone Star tick, which include some of our new uh, viruses that have been identified. One of those is Heartland virus. The other is Bourbon virus. These are new, fairly new to the U.S. Uh, within the past five years of being identified specifically in Oklahoma and in the central U.S. as being a tick-borne virus that has been transmitted. So the, the, the best thing you can do if you find a tick on you, and if it's attached, is to get, you, get yourself a pair of tweezers uh, and just pull it out slowly. Uh, do not yank that tick out. Do not try to put any kind of liquid, whether it's Vaseline, uh, bleach, or alcohol on that tick. You want to pull it out, and then you want to put it in a little freezer bag and keep it. And if you start developing sim symptoms, you can go to your doctor then and say, okay, this particular tick was feeding on me. It's been so many days since it was fed on me. And that gives the doctor a lot of clues that really helps him out in, in his treatment protocols. Most ticks take uh, 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 several hours to attach and to begin feeding. So as far as doing, transmitting pathogens, what we see again is are the, on those individuals that may have had a tick on them, but didn't necessarily pull that tick off until like maybe 20, after 24 hours. If you go out into an area that has ticks and you find ticks on you and you pull it off that same day, we usually see a lower risk in uh, tick-borne uh, pathogens being transmitted into, uh, onto you. Hi, 
I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. May is the month when our winter crops mature and our summer crop and pasture growth kick into high gear. In May, we need good soil moisture for both winter and summer crops. And for most of Oklahoma, we have great soil moisture. A map of the plant available water from the surface down to 32 inches through May 3rd has a lot of dark green areas with soils close to 100% of their water holding capacity. The lower moisture spots are the yellowish areas. Eric is the lowest mesonet site at 35% of plant available water down to 32 inches. Mesonet also has plant available water maps in inches of water. Miami, Copan, Haskell, and Salisaw have over nine inches available. That's enough water for close to a full month of water demand. Hollis and Eric are just over two inches available. Two inches is enough for about eight days of water demand. Wednesday, we had a fair jump in air temperature between morning lows and afternoon highs. Most lows were in the 40s. Many highs were close to 80 degrees. That made it easy to find mesonet sites with at least a 30 degree jump in air temperature. Hollis had a 46 degree change from low to high. Here's Gary with a check on past rainfall and future outlooks. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, for once, finally I get to talk about all good news. So let's go right into the latest U.S. Drought Monitor report and start there. As you can see, drought has been mostly wiped out across all of the state. We still have a little bit of D1, that's a moderate drought, out across far western Oklahoma, west central Oklahoma. We do have some patches of that D0 yellow color, which is abnormally dry conditions, um, but with further rains, that should be eradicated as well. So we're well on our way to getting rid of this drought that's cropped up in the first three and a half months of the year. What happened to that drought? Well, April happened to that drought. Here's the departure from normal rainfall map for April, and you can see most areas of the state about two to four inches above normal, and some areas even more than that. We can still see some areas close to normal, though, out across that west central area and up in north central Oklahoma where those colors remain on the drought monitor map. But a wet spring started off with a, a good wet April. As for the future, as we look towards May, the Climate Prediction Center sees increased odds of below normal temperatures across most of the state, especially the western half of the state. And we also see increased odds of above normal precipitation over all of the state, especially the southwestern half half to two-thirds of the state. So that's great news for the state of Oklahoma. So the rest of the spring, it's simply a matter of getting our normal rainfall and keeping this drought from uh, beginning once again, and we'll be on our way to a, a very nice spring. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. There have been movements in the livestock industry, and Daryl, let's talk about total meat production across the, across the board. You know, we're going to see an increase in total meat production in the U.S. this year. Uh, you know, beef production is going to be up in the neighborhood of 4%. We keep rev revising that up a little bit mm -hmm. uh, as, as it looks like we're making a little faster progress. Poultry production will also be up about uh, 4%. Pork production is going to be pretty steady with last year, but that's, uh, that's con compared to a, a large increase in pork production last year. So, so more total meat production in the U.S. this year. So we're talking about the supply side of that. Lots of meat to go, to, to go around, but are, are, are there the consumers to, to eat all that meat? Well, you know, we're going to see some adjustments when we when we take into account the, the trade impacts, then consumption will actually be up as well, but not up nearly as much. Uh, beef consumption will be up around, we're, we're thinking one and a half to two percent. Um, you know, broiler consumption, perhaps a little bit more than that. Pork consumption may actually fall a little bit in terms of domestic consumption this year. So what is actually causing all of that? Well, you know, trade, we have to account for trade adjustments, and that can be both meat flowing in uh, and meat flowing out. And, and it turns out that uh, there's relatively uh, more, more noticeable impacts this year uh, across the board for all the meat. So we're looking at uh, less beef imports and an increase in beef exports that, that offsets that increase in production. We're looking at recovery in pork exports and recovery in poultry exports, both of which then will reduce the impacts there. And so uh, the 
the uh, the domestic supplies that will be consumed in the U.S. will be will be lower. Uh, you know, obviously there will be an increase in total meat supplies, mm -hmm. and that will pressure prices. Uh, generally speaking, more so for beef because it's running a little bit faster than the other meats. But uh, but again, the trade impacts really moderate those production increases. How often in in, in, a, in a marketing cycle do we see something like this happen? Well, it's a little bit unusual. I mean, there's always trade impacts, but to see it change so much from one year to the next is a little unusual. Obviously, we've been struggling with a strong dollar, which has impacted all the meats in terms of exports and imports, mm -hmm. uh, and that's moderated a little bit in recent weeks. Um, but the other thing, we had avian influenza last year, which impacted the poultry market. Um, it, you know, pork has been down uh, as well, and so uh, and and beef as well. Uh, and we had very strong signals for a lot of imports the last two years in beef, and that's going to back off this year. So it's a bit unusual to have all of them changing so much at one time. Now, I, I, I want to kind of turn gears a little bit towards the beef side. We're talking about rebuilding the herd. Is, is this really a perfect storm for rebuilding the herd? I mean, the, 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 the pastures are green, there's more cattle coming about? Well, we're certainly still in rebuilding mode. We had a large increase in the beef herd last year and, and uh, it really started in 2014. That's the beginnings of increased beef production we're seeing now. Uh, it will continue. Uh, we'll see more herd expansion in 2016 and, and really starting this year, we start to see that beef production increase that naturally follows the increase in, in the herd size. And, and, and when will we be back at pre-drought levels? It looks to me like, uh, in terms of the herd size, the beef cow herd, probably by the end of this year. I think going into 2017, we'll be at pre-drought levels, and then the question will be how much bigger than that might we need to be at this point. We're, we're watching that. It's kind of a moving target at this point. We really don't know for sure, but it'll probably be somewhat bigger than that. Okay, thank you much. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Are you ready for the spring calving season? Whoa, what does that mean? Spring calving season is just being wrapped up and, and we're headed into the summer breeding season. No, I'm talking about are we getting ready for next year's spring calving season? Because now is the time, I think, when we can make some adjustments to really help ourselves and improve our success next spring. Now's the time, I think, to look back in our calving book and see what problems we had, see if there's any patterns, and therefore we can make some differences right now. Uh, look back in that book and mark down any calves that you've lost and see when that happened. If there was a high percentage of them that you lost right at calving, and especially to two-year-olds, that may mean a signal then that we need to take a look at our breeding program, making sure that those two-year-olds are always bred to low birth weight uh, EPD bulls. Also, it, it may signal that we need to take a look at our heifer growing program to make sure those heifers are well developed. Now. If we saw a pattern where we had a, a quite a little bit of sickness and perhaps death loss at one week to maybe three weeks of age, that usually signals a, a high rate of calf diarrhea or calf scours that's been a problem in our herd. Again, I think that means we need to reassess several things that we can take care of right now. Number one, heifer development. As we're growing our replacement heifers, let's make sure that those heifers are in a body condition score six at calving time next year. Also, is there a per high percentage of the heifers that went through a difficult birth? We know that those calves that uh, were in stage two of labor for in excess of an hour are weakened calves, they're slower to get up, find the teat and nurse, and therefore again are deprived of that colostrum in time to give them the best disease protection. And if we know we had a high percentage of calf diarrhea causing problems in our herd, I'd really suggest that you spend some time visiting with your local veterinarian. Perhaps you need to look at some other things such as the uh, pre-calving uh, calf scours vaccination for cows. Perhaps there's a buildup of some of the pathogens, the bacteria, the viruses that can cause calf diarrhea. This may be the year that we need to reassess that, plan ahead, and 
move that pasture at least for a year's time so that we can give the old one some time to rest and get rid of some of those pathogens. You might also consider making sure that during the upcoming calving season that as newborns are born that we get them out of that calving pasture as soon as possible so that they're less likely to pick up those pathogens or pass them along to the next calves that might be born in that, pa in that calving pasture. I think if we'll take time to assess where our problems were this year, then we have a chance to really make some changes between now and next spring to reduce the problems that we had, have a higher percentage calf crop, more calves to sell the following year at sale time, and of course, therefore, improve our bottom line. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. There's a lot of talk across the state about a bumper wheat crop and low prices. Kim, let's start out with the, with the price. What's happening? Well, if you look at uh, prices, uh, they're continuing to go down. The Kansas City July contract, it created a new low this week at uh, $4.50. It closed at $4.52 that day. Uh, you look past the last couple months at the nearby contracts, they've got a floor at about $4.38. So the July could lose another 12 before it hits that. If you look at the basis, elevators uh, lowered their basis uh, another five cents this, uh, this, this week. And the, the uh, old crop basis and the new crop basis are the same now and they range from about a, a minus 80 cents to a minus 65 cents across the state. The eyes of the world uh, of the wheat world are on Oklahoma and Kansas right now. What are they finding in the fields? Well, they're uh, finding more wheat. Uh, you know, these right, the April showers uh, they made more than flowers this year. Uh, they, we had the Oklahoma wheat crop tour this year, uh, this week, and uh, they came in at 130 million bushels. That uh, you can compare that to a 99 million bushels uh, last year. That's a 31 uh, percent increase in production. If you go back to prices and you look. Uh, at harvest last year, the Oklahoma price was right around $5. It was uh, below five uh, earlier in June. It was above five in July, but then $5 is a pretty good level. Right now, the market's offering about $3.85 to $3.90. That's a 20% decline in the price from last year. With 31% more production, only 20% lower prices, producers will be better off from an income basis this year with more wheat and lower price than they were last year with less wheat and higher price. So let's say that they all, all that 31% more wheat is actually harvested. Where are we going to put all that wheat? Well, space is, is tight and the elevators are, are cleaning facilities right now. I know some elevators are bagging it. I know some elevators are creating, uh, creating outside storage. In other words, they bunker storage mm -hmm. where they're covering it with tarp. I was invited up to uh, Medford or Pond Creek this week to observe some of that. Uh, so the elevators are getting ready, but storage is going to be tight. If you look at uh, this time last year, we had about 60 million bushels in the bin. This year we got 98 million. If we ship 20, that still leaves 78 Eight million bushels we only produced 99 last right. year in the bin so storage is going to be tight if uh, locations that run out of storage the basis is going to go down because the the elevator is going to have to buy and ship that wheat almost immediately so there, there could be a basis problem there let's talk about what that could mean to the Oklahoma wheat farmer and the industry well there's two things that impact that you know three dollar eighty five three dollar ninety cent price we got right now if we run out of storage the basis is going to go down that could take that price down if we also test weights extremely important we've talked about that before if we come in with a say a below a 58 but really below a 60 pound test weight wheat we need 60 or better uh, that, that wheat is not going to be, the, the new crop wheat will go on the market, but we really need some heavy wheat to blend out some of last year's low, low test weight wheat. So we, if we don't have that test weight, I think basis is going to go in the tank because we'll have a lot of light wheat in the bin. Okay, thank you much, Kim. Grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And now here's Jeff Edwards with a preview of the Lahoma Field Day coming up this Friday. Well, we've got a nice uh, tour lined up for our producers. We're going to have registration starting at about 840. The wagons uh, or the tour is actually going to start at 9 o'clock. Parking can sometimes be an issue, especially if we have some wet weather ahead of time, so it's a good idea to show up, uh, show up a little early. Uh, we're going to have a big kickoff to the event uh, with uh, a dedication of our new facility there at Lahoma at the North Central Research Station, the Raymond Sidwell facility. Uh, we're really 
excited about that. Then we'll head to the field and look at some of our plots and our research that's going on there. We'll have our traditional stops with wheat breeding, wheat foliar diseases, looking at wheat varieties. Kim Anderson's going to be there talking about marketing. We're going to have a canola stop. We're going to talk about soil fertility. We're going to talk about cover crops. It's a really neat uh, way to see the diversity of, of the research that's going on there. And it's also a, a nice way to see the work that goes into developing our extension recommendations. Uh, those aren't just pulled out of the air. They're, they're based on actual data and research that's being conducted right here in Oklahoma. And there will also be an opportunity to tour the new facility for those who would like to do that. So it's a great tour and uh, we're really excited about it and anxious to see everybody come out and, and show off our new facility. Our family is extremely honored to have such a great opportunity. My dad was extremely passionate about agriculture, um, wheat breeding, wheat research and agronomy. And I definitely know he could have never imagined a facility uh, like this and be able to do wheat research in a facility like this. You know, it's always been a place that producers could come by and ask questions and, and research the different plots. But I think it was definitely time that something new be built here. And I think now it's a little more of a home. Felt like a part of our life. Um, felt like uh, I grew up here a little bit. We always called it Dad's Station. We come by here and visit my dad during the summer, during his lunch hour or whatever. I hope someday to bring my kids here to, to show them the legacy that he left and also that they're as passionate about agriculture as he was. He was very passionate about the color orange and he would have loved the orange. I, I don't think he would have ever dreamed of being able to work, come to work in a facility like this. I, I don't even have words to explain it. Our family is extremely grateful and honored. Finally today, we take you to Tillman County for a special visit at a thriving family dairy operation. Sent up intern Melanie Jackson has this story. We started out with 40 cows. That was back in 1988. And after, after two years, we moved to the Stephenville area and started, started milking about 300 cows that first year. And then in 2002, we moved to Oklahoma. By that time, we were milking about a thousand cows. We fell in love with this area right here. Today, the Vanderlawns have the second largest family-owned dairy in Oklahoma. We have a total of 3,300 cows right here and uh, milking about, uh, about 3,000. The rest of them are dry cows. Currently, we're feeding about 500 baby calves and there are about 400 of them in the weaning pens. 99% is Holstein. We milk about 25 milking short horns and about 10 brown swisses. Also on this dairy, we uh, farm about 4,500 acres. It's mainly corn silets, wheat silets, alfalfa hay and some sorghum. Whenever you have an operation this large, everyone has their favorite part. I still love every baby that's born, it still takes my breath away. It's a miracle. Every calf that's born, it's still a miracle for me. It's just, uh, I love raising them, I love uh, working with them. It's just, I love the cows just as much, but the baby calves still take my breath away. In the state of Oklahoma, there's around 160 dairy farms, and those dairy farms house around 37,000 lactating dairy cows. We make around 780 million pounds of milk every single year in the state, so it's still quite a lot of um, product that's produced, and it's around a little over $130 million worth of value that's generated on the farm. Nearly 30 years ago, the Vanderlons packed up everything from here to start their lives here. Originally we are from Holland, the Netherlands, and uh, ended up here in the United States because the government in Holland uh, implemented a milk quota so there was no chance to dairy out there for us. So I thought I'll try a year in, in uh, work, work for the year in Texas. After about three months, I liked it so much, never went back, just only to visit. I want to be in the dairy business also, and I was working for a real estate agent in Holland, and uh, I came over here, helped set up dairies for Dutch dairy farmers, and then I helped them set up um, buying the cows, buying feed. Come Thanksgiving, I met Peter. And the rest is history. We've been married for 26 years now. 26 years and three kids later, the Vanderlons are excited for the next generation of dairy farmers. 
you know, they love it just as much as we do. I'm fourth generation, fifth generation dairy farmer. Peter is fifth or sixth. We don't even know exactly how far it goes back. But all my relatives and Peter's relatives, everything goes back to dairy. So to have that also our children follow up in, in our footsteps, it's just, it's unbelievable. It makes you so, we did something right. <laughs> makes you proud. Yeah, it makes you very proud, yeah. Thank you, Melanie. And by the way, our intern Melanie is graduating from OSU today after serving as our intern for two and a half years. Best of luck, Melanie, and congratulations. And that'll do it for us this week. As we leave you today, a few highlights from our visit at the Capitol and a look at just what agriculture means to Oklahoma. We have a model that's more than 100 years old now. And it's funny because sometimes people will say, well, I can go and Google information and get the same thing as I'll get from Extension. And that's absolutely not true. Because what's different about OSU and our land grant system is it begins with research. We have scientists in a variety of disciplines who are watching what are the issues out there that we need better information on, whether it's with animal health or crop production or community development, whatever it may be, we're conducting the research. And, and so when Extension people go out with the information that they share, the workshops they offer, the, the fact sheets that we publish, they're using that most recent current information from research. And so it's the combination of research and extension that really sets us apart. So the other thing that's unique about us is that we are everywhere. We are the only part of Oklahoma's higher education infrastructure that is present in every one of our 77 counties. We have a county extension office there. We also have 18 research stations scattered around the state in addition to all the facilities that we have on campus in Stillwater. And so we're actually conducting research on agricultural practices in the areas that are unique to Oklahoma. And so our research is relevant to people regardless of what part of the state they're in. <laughs>